Well, welcome to the program. Today on Creation Talk, we're going to be reviewing uh, an important recent book by Dr. William Lane Craig called In Quest of the Historical Adam. Now, my name is Keaton Halley, and with me as well as Dr. Jonathan Sarfati. Good day, everyone. And uh, we just want to say up front that we do respect Dr. Craig as a Christian brother. I, for one, have, have learned a lot from Dr. Craig's work, his books. And well, yeah, I, I was reading Dr. Craig's book before I joined CMI 25 years ago. It gives you an idea. Yeah. And, of course, he's an extremely good debater, never mm -hmm. lost a debate. Even though his presentation is very predictable, evolutions have plenty of chance to prepare for him, but they never can actually answer him, and especially <laughs> in his rebuttal where his logic is so strong that he can refute uh, atheistic fallacies. Yeah. And he's done some great work on the resurrection in particular, mm -hmm. in defense of that, arguments for God's existence and so forth. Mm -hmm. But this book we're going to have some critical things to say about because although it purports to give a defense of a historical Adam and Eve, that they were real individuals who lived in, in the past, at the same time, Dr. Craig wants to relegate a lot of the narrative of Genesis 1 to 11 to mythology, that it's not literal history. But he calls it myth of history, but he's mm -hmm. saying that it's not, it didn't happen as it was written. Yeah. So let me give a quick summary of the book before we um, go into our critique. I'd say Dr. Craig's project was to analyze this idea of what does the Bible actually say about Adam and Eve? Does it claim that they're historical? And uh, the book is divided into two parts. First, he analyzes the biblical material and says, well, the genre of Genesis, you compare it to these other ancient Near Eastern myths, and it has these similarities. Therefore, Genesis is also largely mythological, but the genealogies and the New Testament material also would indicate that Adam was a real historical figure. He did commit the first sin and that Adam and Eve gave rise to all human beings that have ever existed. Yeah, so the point is uh, Adam and Eve, he agrees, had real world effects. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there must be real world people because mythological people can't have effects in the real world. Yes. So far, so good. But then to relegate most of the history in Genesis as mythological, you know, I like what Peter Lightheart said in, in First Things in his review. He said, this isn't your fundamentalist grandma's Adam, right? Doesn't look like anything like the biblical Adam either yeah. to me. Yeah, Because, um, mm. you know, basically all the things like God creating in six days, that's not literally true. Um, Adam he wasn't made from dust. Uh, there was no trees, no garden, no literal fruit, no serpent. He wasn't made from his rib. Yep. No flood as well. No, so it's all the way up to chapter 11, no Tower of Babel as the Bible describes it. So the second part of the book then, he does go into the science, but he just presumes that evolution is true, doesn't mm. challenge that. But then he tries to compare, you know, now that I've arrived at this conclusion, there was an Adam and Eve, when could they have lived? Um, if Genesis is not history, then he says it could be as much as, you know, 500,000 back to a million years ago. And that's where you see in the fossil record, he mm. thinks evidence of human beings. Uh, coming into existence, and he says this is consistent with the genetic evidence as well. Yeah, his, his conclusion basically is uh, Adam and Eve were probably Homo heidelbergensis, who probably lived about 750,000 years ago. Yeah. And that species name, he'd say, those are ancestral to Neanderthals and Denisovans and Homo sapiens as well. So he would put all those in the human family, which we do as well. Yes, it's just we do. That we don't mm -hmm. accept the dates as Dr. Craig does. Before we offer critique, John, do we have anything positive to say about this book? Well, I mean, he has to admit that a lot of the young earth creation arguments are exegetically reasonable and also that they were what the church believed for most of its history. He rejects the Hugh Ross type arguments for a local flood. Yeah. He rejects a lot of He actually of appeals to a number of your own arguments in your commentary. Yeah, he says that, they're, they're quite potent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and also against the people like John Walton who want to say that the ancient Bible writers taught a flat earth, and he accuses them of being very hyper-literal mm, in the yes. way they understand ancient Near Eastern myths. I mean, would anyone, he asks, believe that there was really such a, a dead goddess Tiamat overhead that you're actually seeing when you look up, and if you actually went to the source of Tigris and Euphrates, you actually see the rivers coming out of her eyes. Yeah, they didn't exactly. believe that. Yeah, they didn't. The Egyptians didn't believe that there was a not the sun goddess overhead, or you throw the a stone heavenly, far enough and, yeah. and and hit a knee or whatever. They didn't believe that. Yeah. So they're hyper literalizing, which is interesting because these arguments started with the 19th century atheists. Now you got these so-called evangelicals using the same sort of Bible teach the flat earth uh, yeah. stuff that's... So in, in some yeah. ways, yeah, he is a more conservative than many of these more liberal commentators who would say that the Bible contains this like falsified science. 
I think it's also important that he disagrees with Josh Swamidas, who has been very influential uh, on, on Craig himself. And yet um, mm. Swamidas thinks it's no big deal if you have Adam and Eve only as the progenitors of humankind today. Yeah. Whereas, but there were people in the past who are human beings in the image of God, but not descended from Adam and Eve. Craig right. says, no, Adam mm -hmm. and Eve need to be at the headwaters of the entire human race. Which means he also rejects the people, the biologos people, like mm -hmm. yeah. um, Collins, Venema, who say that Adam and Eve didn't exist. Mm -hmm. he, he totally rejects that yeah. liberalism, basically. And I, I think one other important area of agreement is that, maybe we mentioned this already, but the, the fact that he does attribute humanity to these other fossils that evolutionists classify as different species of homo, mm. mankind, some, like Hugh Ross, have said these are just animals, not descended from Adam and Eve, and yet Craig clearly recognizes that these give all kinds of evidence of having been that That's a are huge humans. weakness for Hugh Ross, uh, that you've got these definitely human things with um, human anatomy and human cultural, yes. but he says they're animals, and they're, but then uh, you show that Homo sapiens interbred with Neanderthals and Denisovans, therefore he says they committed bestiality. Yeah. So it just shows you how badly Hugh Ross is led astray by yeah. his, his yeah. uh, long earth dogma. And it, how it's even more preposterous when you realize that that means that they had offspring with these alleged animals and kept having offspring down mm -hmm. to the present day so that we are descended from these human animal <laughs> hybridization events. But thankfully, Craig, Craig rejects that. He realizes. You know, we disagree with the chronology, but you have to say that Neanderthals are descended from Adam and Eve. See, we would put these people, these uh, Denisovans, Neanderthals, as post-Babel humans who just lost the ability to build cities and and metal tools. So they use had to build houses and caves and had to use tools from stone. That's all they had. Uh, so they came after Babel. Division. Yeah, not not any reason to see them as dim-witted, you know, ape-like ancestors. They're fully fully human. One of the main areas we want to critique is this idea that Craig lists a bunch of evidences to compare Genesis with ancient Near Eastern myths and says Genesis has these kind of telltale signs. He calls them family resemblances. Mm. He lists 10 and then goes through them in detail on page 45 and 46 of his book. And so yeah. I just want to read through Please. these and let's think about, you know, did these really show that, that Genesis is mythology? Mm. And then from Genesis 12 onward, that gives us genuine history. Number one is he said, this, these are characteristics of myths, right? Mm -hmm. Myths are narratives, whether oral or literary. But so are historical narratives, <laughs> narratives. I mean, yeah, it it's seems not, to prove too much. It's not it? particularly diagnostic. And it, actually, I don't even know that I agree with that that's very diagnostic of myths in general, because you can have like the Egyptian iconography of mm. the structure of the universe, and that's not a narrative, right? I mean, C.S. Lewis attacked these people who wanted to mythologize the New Testament by saying, well, how many myths have you actually read? I mean, mm -hmm. the New Testament is nothing like these myths. There's a difference between the myths and the biographies of the New Testament, yeah, right? Yeah. Very good. Uh, number two, myths are traditional stories handed down from generation to generation. Again, that can apply to pretty much all of Scripture, right? Yeah, it can apply um, to real history uh, handed down, too. That's right. Myths, number three, myths are sacred for the society that embraces them. Okay. All of the Bible is seen that way. Number mm. four, myths are objects of belief by members of the society that embraces them. Again, yeah, this applies. Everything proves too much, proves more than he wants to do. That We would say the Gospels are um, also objects of, of, objects of belief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Number five, myths are set in a primeval age or another realm. Um, that one question, seems to be somewhat distinct of, of Genesis, but again, is that really a clear characteristic of well, myth? Well, I, I think it's actually not set in a, in a primeval time because it's actually got clear chronological information from uh, Noah to Abraham, Noah to Adam. Even the day of the flood is set in an actual real time, just the same as, as the gospel. Luke sets the yeah. gospels in the reign of Tiberius and, and all these people anchors it in time, while well, as a myth say, well, once upon a time or many, many years ago, yeah, sure. no uh, absolutely indefinite time as opposed to Genesis' definite time. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it depends how you define primeval time, too. You, if you define it in a fairly innocuous way that it just means like the first age, well then, if Genesis in every other way has the same sort of you know, grammar and so forth as Genesis 12 and following, it should die, then is it the, mm. the, that one element, you know, just that it describes the earliest part of the world, does that automatically make it transition from history to myth? Well, that, if you believe that God created space-time, then there must be a primeval first age, That's right, there? yeah. You can't so, escape it. Yeah. Uh, number six, myths are stories in which deities are important characters. Well, 
Jesus is God, and I'd say he's an important character of the Gospels. <laughs> yeah. And God appears throughout Scripture as mm -hmm. an important, you know, character in that sense. And well, that, isn't the Bible theocentric? Uh, yeah. Yep, very good. Uh, number seven, myths seek to anchor present realities such as the world, mankind, natural phenomena, cultural practices, and the prevailing cult in a primordial time. Um, cult there just means like the worship practices. It's not a derogatory term, right, but yeah. mm -hmm. but again, that could apply to Genesis twelve onwards, except for the again the just that one element of the primordial time. Mm. For that section, when he goes into number seven in, in depth, he talks about the etiologies. But I mean, for instance, you've got Genesis. Uh, the events of Genesis is about four hundred, maybe at least two hundred years between Genesis and Exodus. Why is that not primordial? As opposed to Noah to Abraham is about the same time as Abraham to Moses. Yeah, it's somewhat arbitrary, I think, the way he's defining primeval or primordial, but also you certainly do find etiologies not just in Genesis 1 to 11, mm -hmm. but in the whole rest of the patriarchal narratives and so forth. Origin um, of Israel goes back to Genesis 12, at least, yeah. right? Yeah. And think about, you know, Esau, like Israel's cousin, right? Mm -hmm. You have Jacob, who became the nation of Israel, Esau, his, his twin brother that became the Edomites. And mm -hmm. there's all sorts of things in the story about Esau. He's, he's red and hairy. He's got mm -hmm. this red stew that he gets from his brother well that's because the edomites were characterized by redness they're even their like surroundings so can we dismiss the patriarchal narratives as myths no i think that's giving us genuine history well and jacob wrestled with god uh, mm. in, in person why is that not a myth that's a very much a, a theophany is it not yeah and that gets in, into the next you know numbers eight and nine here craig actually says don't apply it to genesis well wow. and and then number 10 the last one that i think this is really where the rubber meets the road mm -hmm. he says yeah. Many myths exhibit fantastic elements and are not troubled by logical contradiction or incoherence. So he sees, you know, oh, there's too many fantastic things happening on Ge in Genesis 1 to 11 that it must be mm. non-historical. Some of those goes to the issue of the contradictions between Genesis 1 and one, uh, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, which I don't think there are, yeah. if you understand the way A&E literature is written, it's not. Yeah, that's right. And you mentioned that Theophanies, you know, he, he says Genesis 1 to 11 characterizes God in a way that's anthropomorphic. Do we ever see that outside of those first 11 chapters? Well, when do we not see him that way? Because that's how he has to appear to us, yeah. um, uh, right? Yeah, it just means it's, it's treating God as though he has this human form, right? But you see in Exodus, for example, Exodus 2, um, the cry of the Israelite slaves came up to God as though he lives up above and he's not everywhere present, mm, in right? In the burning bush, the very localized um, <clears throat> manifestation yeah. of him, and he appeared, with Mo he showed his face to Moses. In fact, he did a lot more of that to Moses than he did to the to the patriarchs. I mean, he didn't do that much to mm. any people from Adam to Noah, right? Mm -hmm, he he mm -hmm. gave Noah instructions to build the ark, but didn't do a theophany to him. Right. Um, another well, example he gives is the lifespans of the patriarchs. Mm -hmm. What do we say to that? Are they just too, you know, exaggerated, can't be literal that people prior to the flood were living to be 900 years old? They don't like to know how they were exaggerated. I mean, were the days month, but then you have people like uh, Enoch B being a father at the age of five or whatever mm -hmm. it was. I think I did the calculation, yeah. the ridiculous uh, low ages of five, for five. Then you have the fact that the decay of lifespan follows the expected decay of, of a population mm -hmm. under stress, the exponential decay curve. Yeah. What are the chances that the you know ancient... Yeah. Author of Genesis would get that just right that it fits. And then with you think, well, also evidence. Shem's uh, drop of lifespan is consistent with having a very old father. So, again, when you take mm -hmm. the elements, they seem to have these undesigned coincidence. Old father, therefore, yeah. much bit, uh, lower lifespan for Shem. And then you have the exponential decay. And then you have long ages continuing to the time, time of Exodus, even to the time of kings with That's Jehoiada. Right. Yeah, so his argument proves too much there, doesn't it? Well, I mean, it was Jean Calment. Uh, who lived in the 19th century to 122 years, was she legendary, but she died less than 100 years ago, mm. uh, okay, only a few decades ago. Um, yeah. So why is that not legendary? Yeah. Even Moses lived to be 120 years old, mm. Aaron lived to be 123, so those seem to be you know, longer than what Craig considers to be non-fantastic. <laughs> that's what I have to wonder. He's pro again proving too much, and that's the big problem with his book. He proves too much. Very good. And if his uh, views were considered, I think people like uh, John Shelby Spomalate, heretical bishop, were more consistent than Craig in some mm. ways, basically, or well, the whole thing's mythical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, why don't we give a number of positive evidences that the rest of Scripture does treat Genesis as real history? And, and not only in terms of, you know, believing that the, the people themselves existed, but also 
what they did in those narratives. And, and having real world effects as well. That's yes. the thing. So they were therefore real people. Mm, yes. I think we can point to passages like Hebrews 11. There you've got the whole, it's the, the hall of faith, right? This right. list of people starting mm. from creation, Abel, down through Abraham and so Abel, forth. Abel, Enoch, and Noah were the first three. Are there no difference? They were, they were just treated as equally real examples yeah. for us to follow as real people. We can't follow mythical people. They don't exist, but we can follow real people, yeah. hopefully. And, and, you know, Craig does distinguish between, you know, he says some of these proofs of historicity are, are like too easy because it's true that you, you can use somebody in a literary way, you know, like you might talk about Hamlet as an illustration of something and you're not thereby committing yourself to the true existence, existence of Hamlet. Although I th Hamlet was a real historical mm -hmm. character, but the way Shakespeare is writing right, about him, if you yeah. quote those, you're not necessarily saying that that really happened. But we would argue that these later scripture references, at least in many cases, they are clearly committing to the historicity of the events. Well, see, Luke's genealogy of Jesus in Genesis 3 traces him all the way back up to Adam with no hint that the people uh, of Genesis 1 to 11 are any less historical. And it's so important to connect us so we uh, so he can be our kinsman redeemer mm -hmm. by virtue of our common yeah. descent. And also Paul uh, says to the Athenians, we were all made from one man going back to Adam. Mm -hmm. So therefore, a real person with real effects. Yes. And then you've got, I think, uh, 2 Peter 3. is a, we, We've got an article, actually, on, on our website. So mm -hmm. uh, another person outside our ministry um, reviewed the book. Right, and they yes. mentioned um, 2 Peter 3 mm -hmm. talks about the flood. And the whole point there is to say the skeptics are denying that God acts and intervenes in history. And he cites the flood as an example of God really doing something in, in history. So you can't say that's just a literary reference. Otherwise, what so do other skeptics therefore no longer culpable if, in fact, this event never happened? They are not to be why are they blamed for yeah. being scoffers. Yeah, and the, and the whole argument is about you know they're saying oh things just continue on as they have always been. There's no radical changes. That's why we believe Jesus is not going to come back. The, the scoffers mm -hmm. say, according yeah. to Peter, right? But he cites the flood as a counter example of that because it happened yeah. in the past. God intervened it's in history. Well, we've got one Timothy as well, number two, and he talks about Adam was created first, then Eve. Yeah. So therefore, that's quite different from his view of them both evolving from an ape-like mm, yes. creature. No, Adam was created before Eve, and this is why you do certain things in the church, because of this historical reality. Yeah. And Eve was deceived. Adam did it willfully. Therefore, the fall comes from Adam because of his willful sin. Yes, citing the order of events. Another one I would add is that there's various passages where the New Testament authors, including Jesus himself, uh, you know, the, the gospel writers writing for Jesus, they say that Adam and Eve were here, or humankind was here from the beginning of creation. They were male and female. That's Mark chapter 10, verse 6, Matthew 19, mm, 4, and other places, not, Romans 1. Not yeah, I've written several articles. Craig was actually interviewed on the Unbelievable oh, just radio Bali podcast. People. Okay, yep. yeah. mm. uh, that's another one I listen to regularly. Okay, Josh Swamidas was on uh, oh, yeah. the show with Craig, and, and he, he put that argument to Craig. And Craig's answer was, I, and this is quoting, I think that's a fatuous argument that young earthers are trying to impose on the text. I mean, if you'd interpret the text that literalistically, Adam and Eve weren't created in the beginning because it wasn't until day six that they were created. And so if you're going to be that literalistic, the argument backfires. He says, I think when Jesus says from the beginning, he just means that there weren't any people before Adam and Eve. But our arguments on the website have dealt with that. Your That's article, right. I think Carl's old article, Carl Wheatland's had a article called um, yeah, creation.com slash Jesus hyphen age and talks about the num number line when you've got 4,000 years from Christ to, cre uh, to creation and six days from that you can't even distinguish from the beginning of that number line. Yeah. Uh, you need a, a microscope so to distinguish. He's being them. approximate there, right? Yeah. We're, it, we're not saying like it is strictly speaking the very beginning. But also Craig misunderstands what, what is meant by the term creation in Jesus' yeah. words there. Jesus did not mean the, the creative act, like the process, mm. right? If I say the creation of this artwork took a long time, I'm referring to the creative the process, process, the act. Yes. But no, Jesus clearly means in context and in the various scriptural passages that are parallel to it. Yeah, a lot of those. They talk they? about mm. the creation that God created. This means yeah. the the thing that he made, which is the whole created realm. From the beginning of that, yes, exactly. there were human beings, which means he is affirming that the age of the earth, of mankind is is young and, mm. and it's coincident with the beginning of the whole Compare created scripture realm. Compare scripture with scripture. That's what you find. And that's yeah. why you find... Uh, 
uh, all the church fathers were young earthers. They weren't all literal six-day creationists, but even Augustine and Oregon were very much young earthers because of this sort of consideration. And yep. the reformers were actually not only young earthers, but six-day creationists too. Yeah. And from there, we wanted to talk about a few other things where that are a bit more maybe tangential to Craig's mm -hmm. main argument and our main disagreement with him. But I think it is concerning the way he exegetes, the way he interprets a number mm. of these New Testament passages like Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 that deal with Adam. Mm -hmm. For example, in Romans 5, Craig says that even though it talks about the fall there, right, and death coming because of what Adam did, Craig says this is not talking about physical death. It's only talking about spiritual death. And he says, mm. in general, Adam and Eve would have died even had they never sinned. So Which again it, goes against what the church has always taught for one thing, and it goes against what the scripture has always taught, yeah. and goes with what Paul has always taught about the physical resurrection of Jesus, mm -hmm. which contrasts with the physical death that Adam brought. I mean, Paul emphasized 1 Corinthians 15, he goes to Jesus, the last Adam, in contrast to the first man, Adam, but Jesus rose physically from the dead, left the tomb right, empty. Yeah. And of course, Paul is himself reflecting on the events of Genesis. Genesis is very clear when it says that as when God meted out the punishments, mm. the one for Adam said that he would now return to the dust from which he came. Which right? is That's physical death. A physical death. And you've got passages like Romans 8 that, mm. you know, say the whole creation is groaning as a consequence of Adam's sin. And death is called the last enemy. I think that's in 1 Corinthians 15. It is, yes. Why is yeah. death an enemy if that was a, a natural part of the way God set things up and oh. not a consequence of sin? I mean, can you really tell me that physical death is very good? Right. I mean, who actually loves physical death of their, <laughs> one of their loved ones? Yeah. Um, who welcomes it? They all think it sucks and they're all mourning. Jesus wept at the death of a friend. Yes. Then you've got... Uh, the passage in 1 Corinthians 15, there Craig also tries to avoid this connection between the fall and physical death because he says that clearly 1 Corinthians 15 is dealing with physical death, but he says that has nothing to do with the fall. I think it's true that in the later part of the passage, like verses 45 and following there, it's talking about Adam as the man of dust, and it specifically refers to his creation. But if you go back to verse 21, mm. there it says, by a man came death. And that doesn't the, mean God, Adam was created mortal. It means that Adam's action mm, brought death. And therefore, it's contrast with uh, because of Jesus, we get resurrection from, from what, right. what Adam did. Yeah. And, and, and since the context is all about the physical resurrection, we can't sort of decide, oh, well, in this case, it actually means spiritual death, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but only in this case, everywhere else it's physical. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a huge problem to sort of divorce those two. And then related to both of these, Craig is quite dismissive of original sin mm. um, in this book. He doesn't explicitly deny it there, but in an interview on, with Sean McDowell on YouTube mm -hmm. uh, that people can access themselves, he does explicitly say that he rejects the concept of original sin. And there he's referring to, to both elements of it, because original sin doesn't just mean the act that Adam committed. It refers to that the we're imputed, sinners, the, the fact uh, that we're, yeah. yes, we ourselves are guilty. That's the one aspect that we were culpable for mm. Adam's sin. Somehow we're united with him as he sinned. And then secondly, it's the idea that we have a sin nature, that we've been corrupted somehow, and so we have this proclivity to sin because mm. of Adam's sinners, actions. Yeah. And without then. imputation of Adam's sin, what happens to the imputation of our sin to Jesus? Mm -hmm. And he takes the punishment we deserve because our sin's imputed to him. Without the double imputation, there's a problem with the gospel, yeah. really. yeah. And so, yeah, I think this is unfortunately quite, you know, an unorthodox move for Craig to make. You know, Ro Romans 5 emphasizes this, and he does go into some detail about, you know, trying to understand that passage, but mm. it definitely is emphasizing the one trespass that brought condemnation. I even want to read here verse Please. 17 of Romans chapter 5. Mm. Uh, there it says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Mm much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gifts of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So contrasting Adam's actions, that, that death reigned through the one man, not mm. just because of what we all did individually, that we imitated Adam mm. somehow, but it emphasizes this idea that, you know, like 1 Corinthians 15 says that in Adam all die. Mm. That shows that we are, we are, uh, we have a solidarity with Adam and are connected to And if you deny done. that, what about what do you do with in Christ will all of us be made alive, those mm -hmm. of us who accept him as our yes. Lord and Savior? Yeah. You've got a problem. Um, as far as the inherited corruption goes, Craig offers an alternative, right? He says it's not merely a coincidence that all people sin. Mm. It is connected to Adam somehow, but his explanation is 
If it's not because of the fall, well, it's because God created us with a biological propensity which leads toward to selfishness. And then he also says that's coupled with the idea that once Adam did sin, then there's a web of corruption in society. Uh, So this is not the devil made me do this, but God made me do (laughs) it. For me, it seems to raise problems about the character of God and when he called creation very good, but yet he gave us this Mm. tendency to stray from him. This very good creation, which had death, carnivory, disease, all the nasty things that we would normally call pretty bad, mortality, as he says. Yeah. One last point on that is I also don't think that that really does solve the problem, Craig's, mm-hmm. Craig's alleged solution, because clearly Jesus also had a, the same biological type of body that we have, and he lived in a corrupt world, yet that didn't guarantee that he sinned. He was sinless. And so this, mm. this can't guarantee that people are going to sin. And so it's, it's a bit veering toward plagi- Pelagianism, honestly, mm-hmm. that it seems to be saying that people are these kind of blank slates that just imitate Adam and what he did, but it's nothing that Adam did that that causes us to be sinners and alienated from God from Well, from I think it seems to be that when you try to marry evolution with the Bible, you are going to become Pelagian. I think Biologos is basically a Pelagian organization. And we've got an article about that on our website as well. All right. Um, finally, we can just uh, make a few comments about the scientific section of the book. Any issues that you see with, with well, that Well, it's interesting. Atheists seem to love the science because then they're not <laughs> moving towards Christianity. They're rejoicing that the Christians are moving towards their position yeah. because what's distinguishable about Craig's position from an atheistic position? Mm. And swallowing the same sort of arguments, radioactive dating arguments, and he swallows, I think, the, the, the pseudogene argument. We've got an article coming up yes. about how the pseudogenes have definite function because the ENCODE project showed that the so-called dunk junk DNA has actually been transcribed into RNA. And see, so the RNA can actually go onto the actual gene and regulate it. So the, the, the pseudogenes are regulated for the gene, like, for instance, making blood cells, which, of course, is vital for our life. Yeah, and so um, and, and if people aren't following this, this technical aspect, it's basically, you know, even though Craig does believe that there was a historical atom, he still has no problem with him descending from ape-like ancestors, right? right? And mm-hmm. he, he bases that argument on what evolutionists say about we have these shared, what are called pseudogenes. They're supposed to be shared like mistakes, broken yeah. genes. Mm-hmm. In other words, the evolutionists argue God wouldn't have put these similarities between you know chimpanzees and human beings. The reason we share those broken genes is because they're, they're non-functional mm. and they broke in our common ancestor. But the problem with that is, as you're saying, there's all kinds of evidence that these alleged pieces mm. of junk DNA are not junk at all. They're actually, they do have function. And they also should be more dis- dissimilar because if they're not doing anything, then mutations should accumulate. There's no selection to yes. try to weed them out. If they're not doing anything anyway, what's a, what's a harm and a mistake? And yet they're much more similar than yeah. evolution would and predict. And that, so. that indicates that they do have function. The fact that yeah. you know, evolutionists call them highly conserved, right? He should be listening to us on the science <laughs> instead <laughs> of listening right. to the atheists. Yeah. It stood out to me that he spends all this energy trying to show that Neanderthals, Denisovans, uh, Heidelberg man, they're all human beings. But I wondered before the book came out, what's he going to say about Homo erectus? Because Mm. in our literature, we show that there's tons of evidence that Homo erectus is also just as human, must be made in the image of God. Definitely, yes. Um, And yet he almost ignores that in in the book. He kind of tries Mm. to dismiss it by saying they have a small cranial capacity, right? The, the size of their brains. But 20 years ago, we wrote something about how it's actually within the range of, of modern homo sapiens. Yeah. So on yeah. the lower end, but they're, I mean, they're still bigger than like the biggest apes, right? Much and very things. big uh, qualitative and quantitative difference. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and so no reason to see homo erectus as less intelligent. Similarly, like with the Neanderthals, they also have culture that indicates they probably controlled fire. They had pigments. The kind of technology they had was the Aculean stone tools like the teardrop shaped hand axes that's not like a simple like tool something made by an ape that's more sophisticated than some of the most basic stone one tools paper that we said find. that neanderthals made high-tech super glue that's mm. what that was their words yeah and even homo erectus we find them on these islands like crete and the mm. islands in indonesia right why, why is that significant well because they would have had to make ocean voyages to do it which means they had sailing and navigation capacities which is not what an ape can yeah can do. You, you can't just swim across right so even evolutionists believe that they had rafts or boats of some kind mm-hmm. and, and that indicates they probably had language too to communicate to one another to navigate 
Mm -hmm. um, the C's and so forth. So, uh, you know, e even Casey Luskin, who's part of the intelligent design right, movement. old earth guy, yeah, yeah. Yeah, doesn't believe in a young earth, but he's been critical of Craig mm -hmm. on this same point. I actually think he's a bit too soft on him, but he recognizes mm -hmm. that Homo erectus sure seems to be human as well. So but that, of course, is hard for him because he has to put Adam back even further than yeah. he wants, which which makes nonsense of the biblical chrono genealogies. Yeah. yeah, and of course, I mean, he relegates all that to mythology. So, but yeah, it still is a, a confusing that he mm. ignored that evidence. So uh, any final words before we wrap up? No, just uh, we'd like to see Craig uh, get back on biblical knowledge and, and with his ability, intelligence and logic, he could do be a very good young with creationist yeah. apologetics if he actually humbled himself to believe the Bible over evolutionary long age science. Yeah, it is sort of a shame that he, he admits in the book that he's not even critically analyzing evolution, just assuming it. Mm. But man, what if he had spent all that time and effort on debunking some of these claims that, mm -hmm. that are in our literature, we've shown that there are, you know, so many aspects of evolution have been disproven. And so mm. people can have confidence that it, it does align with Genesis, even if you take it all as real history. Exactly, yes. So we just encourage people who have questions about this to check out the links we'll supply in links the show below. notes, yep. mm -hmm. interact with us in the comments, and make sure you click the like, bu like button if you've enjoyed this video content to get more. Share it on your Facebook, Twitter, well. uh, yeah, Instagram. Yeah, and there's lots Rumble, more information whatever. available yep. at mm -hmm. creation.com.